In the vast, uncharted depths of space, a new galaxy has been discovered. A windfall of planets, resources, and ancient relics, all waiting to be claimed. As hordes of disparate factions swarm into this new territory, those who will succeed realize that they must band together in powerful alliances, lest they be overwhelmed by their enemies. And all of this massive conflict can be found in this small box. Seriously, this box is tiny, and it's really impressive how much game they packed into it. So, hi, I'm Shay Parker, and this is RTFM, the show where I teach you how to play a game, whether it comes in a big box or one that almost fits in your pocket. Now, before we start, I should mention that this video has been paid for by the publishers for their Kickstarter campaign, but since I'm not here to review the game, just to teach it, you don't have to worry about any bias. I'm also using a prototype, so the final version may end up looking a little bit different. Now, with that out of the way, let me tell you what's going on. In Age of Galaxy, you will play as an alliance of alien factions, exploring a new galaxy full of worlds. Over the course of five rounds, you'll settle on planets, build powerful fleets, engage in scientific pursuits, and do a whole bunch of other stuff. At the end of the game, you'll count up victory points from a number of different sources, and whoever has the most VPs will prove that their empire is the most worthy and win the game. While the box is small, the opportunities held within are vast, so let's learn how to play Age of Galaxy. First things first, before we get started, please turn on the Klingon subtitles. I use them to correct any potential mistakes, and you won't even notice them unless there's something I need to fix. Once you've done that, let's get everything set up. We've got a few public boards to put out, as well as five randomly selected system cards. Leave them face down for now, though. You'll draw three of the five trade cards, put them with this side face up above the action board, and place this reference card nearby. Each player will also get their own reference card, along with a player board, some tokens, action cubes, ships, and seven faction cards. On the player board, set the yellow credits marker at zero and the orange production marker at three. As for the faction cards, look at them, choose up to three cards to discard, and draw back up to seven. Then place one of the factions in front of you face up and gain resources matching the symbols shown on the top left. I know right now you don't know why one card would be good over another, so here's a brief rundown. During the game, you will be making an alliance of up to three faction cards. These cards will provide abilities and will earn you credits and or ships when you add them to your alliance. They also have ideologies, which will determine an endgame scoring opportunity, and favored biomes, which let you colonize new types of planets. Or, if you don't care about any of that, you can discard them during the game for one-time bonuses. I know that's not quite enough to make an informed decision yet, but once we go over the rest of the mechanics, it'll be a lot easier. After everyone has chosen their starting faction, reveal the first two system cards, covering this symbol with a random exploration token. Then place the Galactic Fleet token on the first card as shown, and choose a first player however you like. Stack a single action cube for each player on the prestige track, with the first player on top and the rest in clockwise order going down. Depending on the player count, you may need to add a few things. Let's say we're playing a three-player game. So on the system cards, we'll need to place a random exploration token and planet token on any matching spaces that show this three plus. On the trade cards, some of the spaces would be covered up by cubes from an unused color, but since we have three players, we can leave this one empty. Do the same thing for the Galactic Congress card, and once that's all sorted, you're ready to start playing. Age of Galaxy plays out over five rounds, and each round contains four phases. Production, Action, War, which is skipped on the first round, and Galactic. Most of the gameplay takes place during the Action phase, but all of them will be important. Starting with Production, each player will take three Action Cubes of their color. Next, you look at your player board and note which space your productivity marker is on. Advance your credits marker by this many spaces, and then reduce your productivity by one. After that, if you have any faction cards in your alliance that have a production ability, you may trigger them in any order. Once this is done, each player moves on to the action phase. During the action phase, each player will take turns spending their action cubes to activate various actions. On top of this, during your turn, you may activate as many free actions as you like, which are denoted by this lightning bolt, and you can play one faction card from your hand. I'll talk more about faction cards a little later, though. For now, let's look at the different actions you can take, which are all shown on the action board. Now first up is the bread and butter of 4X games, Colonization. This action allows you to peacefully acquire a planet by placing a cube there and gaining the reward shown beneath. However, there is a cost and a few restrictions. The cost is how many planets you have already colonized when you take the action, which means that the first planet you colonize is free, but if the board looks more like this, then you'll have to pony up a few credits. The restrictions are that the planet must be available, reachable, and you must be able to adapt to the planet's terrain. Let's talk about each of these concepts in turn. Available planets have not been claimed by any player, either with a cube or a ship. Next, reachable planets are ones that we can reach. 
Looking at the board, we see the galactic fleet marker currently on the first system. This will move to the right every turn, which is important because every planet on the system containing the fleet marker and every system to the left is reachable, whereas the systems to the right are not. You can discover a technology which will allow you to reach the next system over, but we'll talk more about tech when we get to the research action. As for habitability, the cards in your alliance all show a biome that they can adapt to. If we only have humans in our alliance, that means we can colonize warm planets, but not in the others. If we later add these cute-looking Zephyrions to our alliance, though, they'll allow us to also colonize Arctic planets. Once you've colonized a planet, you can take the Develop action. This costs 7 credits and allows you to place your action cube on top of a colony cube you placed earlier. Colonies and developed planets will earn you points at the end of the game, but developing a planet also earns you one prestige, which is also worth points. But it also gets you a second reward that you can choose, either one credit and one production, or one influence, a resource we'll be using quite a bit later on. Of course, you don't have to settle on planets peacefully. Instead, you can be a real jerk and do it by winning wars. But in order to do that, you'll need cruisers, and you build cruisers by taking the manufacture action. Place your cube onto the manufacture space, and then spend credits to build your ships. Each ship costs two credits, and you can hold a maximum of five ships in your hand. Cruisers are good for war, but they're also needed for the explore action. This allows you to send a ship to a reachable anomaly and gain the reward on the other side of the token. In order to take this action, you'll need to spend a cruiser, but you'll also need to have at least one strength, which you get from technology or faction cards. If you're all set, place your action cube on this space and take one reachable anomaly off the board. Flip it over and receive your prize. In this case, you'll gain one relic and two discoveries. Now, relics are worth points, and discoveries can be used in a number of ways, one of which is to take the retrieve action and turn them into relics. Place your cube on the retrieve space, and for each discovery you want to convert, spend three credits. So here we could spend six credits and flip over two discoveries. Next, let's look at the trade action. This allows you to interact with the trade cards we placed during setup. Place a cube onto an available space, and then you have two options. On this card, for example, you can spend one influence and gain five credits, or you can spend seven credits and gain two prestige. If there are no spaces left on the card, you won't be able to use its ability for this action. However, being full up means that during the next galactic phase, a golden age will be triggered, returning some action cubes to players and flipping over the card. Once flipped over, the action is less valuable, but the card can accommodate any number of action cubes. It's also worth noting that if you don't have enough resources to make a trade, you can't take this action to just block off a space. Now here's a quick and easy one. When you scavenge, place your cube in this box and gain one credit. Nice and simple, but there's one extra effect. This action, as well as manufacture and retrieve, have these little arrows, which show that the cubes left here will be placed onto the corresponding trade cards at the end of the round, which I'll go into more detail when we get to the galactic phase. Up next is Nominate. You need at least one developed planet to take this action, and it lets you spend three influence to place your action cube on a galactic congress space and gain the corresponding prestige bonus. Once these spaces are full, no one will be able to take this action again for the rest of the game. And lastly, we have research, which allows you to strengthen your alliance in a lot of different ways. Let's take a look at your research board and see what's available. At the start of the game, you can only research one of the three techs on this bottom row. Doing so will cost either three credits or one discovery, and you'll need to place an action cube on the tech space. Each tech is a prerequisite for the tech above it, as shown by these pointy arrow bits. So if you learn terraforming, you'll later be able to learn advanced engineering. If you look closely, the techs in the second level have more arrows than the ones below them. That's because they can serve as prerequisites for the techs that are up and adjacent one space. So advanced engineering lets you learn planetary shields and xenology, and hyperspace scanner leads you to all three advanced techs. Advanced technologies show this symbol within the space, and you'll find them both on your tech board and some faction cards. The techs on faction cards have no prerequisites, but all advanced technologies require you to pay an extra discovery in order to gain them, which is what this symbol in parentheses is about. Now let's quickly look at the techs themselves. As you can see, this is the main way you gain strength, and it's how you become able to reach planets in the upcoming system, both of which we mentioned earlier. If the tech shows a resource by itself, you'll just gain that resource when you claim the tech. So Hyperspace Scanner here gives you one discovery right away, but the Science Beam also gives you an ability, which is to gain a discovery every time you take the Explore action. Abilities like this are active for the rest of the game, so make sure to remember that you have it. Now, those are all the main actions, but there are a few free actions to talk about. Some faction cards will grant you these, but everyone has access to three different free actions from the start of the game. During your turn, you can trade in discoveries, influence, or production for credits. These are occasionally necessary, but they're also costly, so hopefully you won't have to use them too much. And to wrap up the action phase, if your turn comes up and you have no action cubes left, you have to pass. 
Once everyone passes, the action phase is over and you move on to war. That is, unless this is the first round. Since war is skipped on the first round, we move on to the galactic phase instead, which is what I'm going to do now. The first thing to do during the galactic phase is to move the fleet to the next system card and reveal the one after it, placing any tokens as needed. If the fleet was already on the last system card, the game ends and you move on to scoring. Otherwise, go back to the actions board and move cubes from the top three actions to their corresponding trade cards like we talked about. Fill up empty spaces, and if this causes any overflow, that's okay, just put it somewhere on the card. If all slots are filled up, this triggers a golden age. During a golden age, return the action cubes on all full trade cards to their owners and flip those trade cards over. This will give players more actions on the next round, but regardless of how many golden ages occur at once, each player can only receive a maximum of three extra cubes during the galactic phase. Any extras get returned to the supply, and you get scolded for being greedy. After any golden ages are resolved, take a look at the prestige board. The turn order for the next round will be determined by each player's position on the prestige track. Since yellow here has the most, they would go first, followed by blue and then green. Hand out these player order tokens to help keep track for the round. And I should mention that whenever you gain prestige, if you land on the same space as another player, place your cube on top of theirs. If you need to break ties for player order, the higher cube wins. Once you've determined player order for the next round, you go back to the production phase and start it all over again. Of course, starting with the second round on, you'll have to make war. So let's learn that really quickly before we wrap up. During the war phase, you're going to count how many cruisers each player has in their hand. Cruisers will occasionally be added to planets, but those won't be counted here. It looks like yellow and green have four ships, whereas blue only has one. Since there's a tie, the tiebreaker is whoever has the most strength. Let's say that yellow has two strength and green doesn't have any, so yellow is the winner, or I should say, the overlord. Check your player reference card to see the rewards. In a three-player game, yellow would gain two credits and one prestige. Since green is in second place, they'd just get the prestige, and blue would get nothing. But yellow gets another reward. As long as there's no tie during war, and remember the tie in this case was broken, so it doesn't count, the Overlord gets to take one of their cruisers and place it on a reachable, unprotected planet, regardless of whether they can colonize on the terrain type or not. All unclaimed planets are unprotected, but so are colonized planets controlled by players if they don't have enough ships to cover them. One ship can protect one planet, and some technologies and faction abilities can help here too, but let's say Blue doesn't have any of those. Since they have two colonized planets and only one ship, that means all of their planets are unprotected and Yellow has the option of taking one of them. Yellow places their ship on the planet, removing Blue's cubes, and now they control it instead. Yellow doesn't gain the resources, and the planet won't necessarily earn them points at the end of the game, but it will trigger any benefits gained from controlling planets, and it will always be considered protected. So Yellow will never lose this planet the way Blue did. Now if Green and Yellow had tied, they would have shared first place and both gotten the rewards for it, but Blue would still be considered to be in third place, so they wouldn't get anything. However, you can't share the conquest bonus of being an overlord, so no one would get to claim an unprotected planet this round. Finally, after all is said and done, each player discards the ships in their hand until they meet their current strength. As we mentioned, yellow has two, green has none, and let's say blue has three. Yellow will lose one ship, green will lose all of theirs, and blue gets to keep their ship. Blue is just flexing here because having more strength than ships doesn't get you anything, but it might be useful later on. So, that's all for the basic gameplay. Up next, we're going to go over the factions in detail and learn how to win. So, up until now, we've just talked about playing faction cards into your alliance. As a reminder, you can play one card per turn, and you can only have three cards in your alliance. Playing a card into your alliance gets you their debut bonus in credits and or cruisers, as well as making their abilities available for the rest of the game. These abilities may be ongoing, they may trigger during the production phase, or when you take specific actions, they may be unlockable technologies, or they may grant an extra bonus when you play the card into your alliance. However, there are two other ways to play faction cards. Each card has a bonus shown on the bottom here, and if you play the card as a reinforcement, gain that bonus and then discard the card. The third way to play a faction is as the true major ideology. See, the cards in your faction all have a specific ideology in the top left. At the end of the game, you'll see if any of them hold a majority, which will be your major ideology. In the case of a tie, you won't have any major ideology, and you'll be real jealous of the other players, so try not to let that happen. This is important because each ideology grants you a different endgame scoring condition, all of which can be found on the flip side of the big reference card. Of course, you might see a better option based on your board state, so if you want to change your major ideology, you can tug a card beneath your other faction cards, and then regardless of the symbols in your alliance, this will be your true major ideology. Now let's get to scoring and see how this all plays out. At the end of the fifth round, when the Galactic Fleet marker can't move any farther, each player will count up their points and whoever has the most wins the game. 
First, take a look at the prestige board. Each prestige is worth one point, so that's easy enough to track. Next, players will get one point for each basic colony and two for each developed colony they control. You'll also get one point for each relic you have, and finally, you're gonna get points based on your major ideology. If your focus is science, you'll gain two points for each advanced technology you've researched. Military alliances will gain one VP for every planet acquired by cruisers. A diplomatic ideology gets you an extra point for every four points of prestige you have, rounded down. An industrial ideology gets you an extra point for each developed colony. And cultural folks will get an extra point for every two relics they have, rounded down. If there's a tie, whoever has the most prestige wins the game, or whoever's cube is on top if that's tied. Now that's about it, but there are two quick optional variants that you can play with. First off, if you want, you can reveal all of the map tiles at the beginning of the game so you know what's coming and can plan accordingly. Second, after dealing out faction cards, instead of each player getting to discard a few and draw back up, you can do a basic draft instead. Each player looks at their hand of cards, chooses one to keep, and passes the rest to the next player. Repeat this until everyone has seven faction cards and continue with setup. This, however, is only recommended for experienced players. And that's how you play Age of Galaxy. Thank you so much to Ice Makes Games for commissioning this video. If you're a publisher and want to hire RTFM to teach your game, please send me an email. My contact info can be found in the About section of the RTFM channel page. Everyone else, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Bye!